My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American ninja warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. For over 10 years now, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance, and now I'm here to shorten your learning curve. Whether you're a creative professional who edits, writes, or directs, you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're a weekend warrior, I strongly believe that you can be successful without sacrificing your health or your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's design the optimized version of you. Hello, and welcome to the Optimize Yourself podcast. If you're a brand new optimizer, I welcome you and I sincerely hope that you enjoy today's conversation. If you are inspired to take action after listening today, why not tell a friend about this show and help spread the love? And if you're a longtime listener and optimizer OG, welcome back. Whether you're brand new or you're a seasoned vet, if you have just 10 seconds today, it would mean the world to me if you clicked the subscribe button in your podcast app of choice because the more people that subscribe, the more that iTunes and the other platforms can recognize this show, and thus the more people that you and I can inspire to step outside their comfort zones to reach their greatest potential. And now on to today's show. When editor and first AE Chris Patterson reached out to me earlier this year, he was stuck trying to figure out how to convince his colleagues that he was ready to edit. He knew he had the skills, but he didn't have the experience or the credits such that people were willing to take the chance on him. However, not even six months later, after working with me in the Optimizer Coaching and Mentorship Program, Chris posted this in our WINS channel in the Slack community. Hey, everybody, got a gig editing a low-budget indie feature from an 85% cold outreach email that I sent out just last Friday. Thanks to everybody in the community for all the help, the feedback, and the support. Now, a little bit more about Chris. Chris Patterson has spent much of his career as the lead first AE, working with some of the biggest names in editing and directing. Just a short list of the features that he's worked on includes Ready Player One, The Post, Royal Tenenbaums, Zero Dark Thirty, The Town, and Analyze That. And Chris has worked with editors such as Michael Kahn, Dylan Titchener, Billy Goldenberg, and many more. But when Chris decided that it was time to make the transition into the editor's chair, let's just say he hit more than a few roadblocks. One of his biggest fears was that he was quote unquote bothering people in his outreach. Another fear was selling himself without having to sound egotistical about his level of skill and his experience in the industry. But I mean, come on, the guy's worked with Spielberg. And ultimately, Chris didn't know how to address the elephant in the room that he didn't have enough editing credits for somebody that was going to take a chance on him. When the pandemic hit and Hollywood shut down, Chris recognized this was the time to make the transition. Yet his fears of bothering people and asking for help left him feeling stuck and unsure of how to make this change. That's when he joined the Optimizer community, and that is where he learned some valuable lessons and tools, which led him to getting a job editing his first feature. In today's conversation, Chris talks all about the challenges that he faced with networking, the mindset shifts that he made, and the aha moments that got him unstuck and moving to the next level of his career. And then in the latter half of the interview, you're going to hear me put Chris on the hot seat as we prepare him for how to confidently sell himself as a capable editor that any producer would hire for their next project. Now, if today's interview inspires you to take the next steps towards designing a more fulfilling career path that not only aligns you with work you are passionate about, but also includes some semblance of, I don't know, work-life balance maybe, and especially if you would like support, mentorship, and a community that can help you turn your goals into a reality, I am excited to announce that fall enrollment is officially open for my Optimizer Coaching and Mentorship Program. To learn more about all the program has to offer and how I can personally help you design your path and determine your next steps towards your definition of success without, of course, sacrificing your sanity in the process, you can learn more by visiting optimizeyourself.me slash optimizer. Enrollment closes Monday, September 13th. All right, without further ado, my conversation with editor Chris Patterson, made possible today by our amazing sponsor, Ergo Driven, who is going to be featured just a bit later in today's interview. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspirational interview, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. 
It's not enough to do good work. You have to put it out. If you want to move into the editor's chair, if you want to do something else, you have to put it out there. You have to talk to people about it. And you have to find the people that are willing to help you do that because you can't really make that. I mean, it's very rare that you can just be like, bam, and and make that move without anyone else's hands helping you a little bit. You can't, I mean, it's in this, I don't know about other industries, how it works. For me, that's what I found is everybody that I've talked to, you know, how did you get to this position? It's always with the help of A, with the help of B. It's not like I'm a superstar and I just did it. Presto. It was someone always, you know, there's always some. So you have to ask for the help. I mean, that's that's a big thing, I think. Well, on that note, I couldn't think of a better way to start the interview than with that. So that having been said, I'm here today with editor and first assistant editor, Chris Patterson. Um, You've got over 20 years experience working on some of the biggest films with some of the top editors and the directors in the field. I'm going to take a big breath because this could take me a while. You've worked with Michael Kahn and Steven Spielberg on Ready Player One and The Post. Uh, You recently worked with Roger Barton on The Tomorrow War. Uh, You've worked with editors such as uh, Dylan Tickner and Billy Goldenberg on Zero Dark Thirty, uh, Andy Monsheen on Analyze That. Uh, I got to be honest, Chris, I'm wondering right now, why in the world aren't you interviewing me? Why am I interviewing you? Like, you should be the star of the show tonight. With that resume, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's funny you say that. For me, there was this funny documentary I saw a few years back on Netflix. With uh, It was about John Huston, and he would just say, it's just a job of work. And that's the way, I, it's just a job. It's just like, jobs that I've done. So what? Like, I don't know. That's the way I look at it. So I knew, I knew that you were going to respond that way. And that's why I put together such a grandiose entrance. Cause I know you'd be like, yeah, whatever. It's, it's just work. It's just a job. And on that note, that's why I'm having you on the show because I love your humility in your approach to the industry. So Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Yeah. It's nice to be here. Uh, so the the main reason, full disclaimer, that I have you on the podcast is because over the last nine months, you and I have gone deep, deep into the weeds talking about networking, building relationships, and how do we better tell our own story. Um, I'm going to let you tell a longer version of this, but essentially, you came to me about uh, nine months ago at the beginning of the year and said, I am ready to make the transition from being a first assistant editor on big name features to being an editor, and there were a lot of barriers that we're going to talk about. But what I love about this story already, and nobody heard this uh, because we were recording off the record before the show, but you are so crazy busy editing a feature right now that nine months ago, it seemed like, how in the world are we going to make that happen? And that is what today is going to be all about, is how you made that happen. So on that note, I want to give people a little bit more of a background of just your general career trajectory, and it doesn't have to be beat by beat, every credit, every movie. Um, But how did you get to the place where after a 20-year career, you're sitting in the same room with Michael Kahn and Steven Spielberg? Yeah, I mean, I can, you can do the, this job led to that job, led to that job, and I can trace it all the way back. I mean, but honestly, that's how it happened. You know, I started in New York. I actually started, I worked at Avid like in the mid 90s in Massachusetts and then got into the assistant editing world in New York and did that and then moved to LA. And yeah, the the Michael Kahn thing happened because I assisted on a random TV show and made friends with another editor that was cutting a different episode. I didn't even work for him. And he had worked on Warhorse and they were looking for people and he remembered me and sent my resume and that was it. Like, it's just like if if people know you and you vouch for people, then you get the next gig. That's kind of how it works. Which is going to kind of be the theme uh, that we began with, with the, the opening of the episode, is that people have to know that you're good at what you do. Right. And I feel like that's an area where you struggle for all the best reasons possible because we've had many conversations. And one of the things that's hardest for you to do that you even had a hard time with as we were doing the introduction of this episode is talking about the fact that you're great at what you do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I like to sit in the room and just do the work and let the work speak for itself. I don't, you know, uh, so that's, uh, yeah. So yes, it is the, the promotional part of it is something that I'm not used to. I've never enjoyed, but I understand that it's part of it. And I don't even like to use the word promotional. It's just like, you know, 
it's it's networking and and also in this covid time it's like a weird networking is totally different now it's uh, you know so you don't see people it's pretty weird yeah so we're going to go back in time to about let's say 9 months or even a little bit more than 9 months ago before you and I officially connected i think the the first time that you and i had kind of unofficially connected was i had done a workshop for the editors guild about the the philosophy of networking and how to approach people and how to provide value i think it was at some time in uh, 2020 yeah um, there was a couple of them there was that one and an imdb pro one i think last it was it was kind of at the beginning of the pandemic kind of mm-hmm. you know, that fall ish so what I want to do, I, I want to uh, I want to jump in a time machine and I want to go back to that period of time and I want to dig a little bit deeper into some of the fears and the hesitations and the doubts that you had thinking to yourself, even though I'm in this place as a first assistant editor on these huge features, this is scary and it's a struggle because I think on the outside, most people that have a lot less experience than you do would just assume when I get to that level, all I have to do is raise my hand and say, hey guys, I want to edit now and you get to edit, but you have a lot of the same fears, doubts, and hesitations being in the place where you wanted to make the transition as anybody else in any point in their career. So let's rewind a little bit and let's dig deep into what some of those fears and doubts were back uh, right before you and I met. Yeah. I mean, there were, you know, there were financial fears, you know, you can make more money first assisting editing on, you know, Tomorrow War than you can make cutting an indie movie. It's, it's just, it's, it's the economics of it. So there's that. And also you brought up, you know, First assisting on a movie like that is 12 months, whereas cutting an indie is like 10 weeks and then it's on to the next thing. So there's financial things. It's it, uh, That was a big part of it. Um, it was also, you know, how to get those gigs, how to convince people that you can do it. I mean, my... And it's funny that you say, you know, once you've been doing it for 20 years, you just raise your hand. So many people that I've met and and sought advice about how like that I've that I've met like that are cutting that weren't cutting five years ago that are cutting now and I've sought their advice. They said the same thing. That's how I thought it worked too. And then I realized it didn't. And you know, it doesn't work that way. It's you know, you can become an editor at 28 or you can become an editor. I met a I have a very good friend that didn't start really cutting till his like mid 50s. And he's a great editor. He cuts huge movies and stuff. But you know, he assisted for a long time and then just the the opportunity came. I mean, there's, you know, so, yeah. The, there's a couple of traps that I feel a lot of people fall into and I want to talk about both of them because I think in certain ways from our past conversations, you've fallen victim to both of these um, at one time or another. The first of which you've already alluded to, which is the idea of, I make really good money as a first assistant editor. And not only is it a good weekly rate, but when you commit to a job on a first uh, assistant on one of these huge films, it's not for three months, it's not for six months. Sometimes it's like for what, a year, a year and a half, maybe even two years. So it's like a really well-paying full-time job. Yeah, yeah, no no doubt. I mean, yeah, Ready Player One was like almost two years. It was great. You know, I remodeled this and, you know, did that. It was, you know, like having a real job. And do you remember the term that you used when we talked about that? It's not, you didn't make it up, but it's a fairly commonly used term for when you're stuck in that position. Oh, like the golden handcuffs, yeah. The golden yeah. handcuffs. That's a, 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 a trap that I find a lot of people fall into at every stage of their career, where what happens, and this is not just editors or assistant editors or people in Hollywood, it's just human nature, um, but there's an actual term for it that's called lifestyle creep. Where as you're starting to expand and make more money, well, you don't, it's not like all of a sudden you have all this money going into savings accounts. Your lifestyle expands to fit the space in which you allow it with the new money. Then all of a sudden you start to get comfortable. You have a larger mortgage, you have a higher car payment, whatever it might be. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm not sure I want to keep doing this, but I have to because I can't afford to do less. Right. So that was one of the things that I had to work out was, you know, Um, Maybe we don't want to talk about this on the podcast because it's boring, but like the practicality of it, like how many banked hours do I have? How long can I go until I need to get a union gig to have health insurance? Uh, Because I have a wife and kid that are on my health insurance, you know, just practical things. How long can I go before my bank account runs out? You know, things like that. I mean, luckily, it was kind of weird that not in the, not that I'm have anything positive to say about the pandemic, but because of the pandemic, 
I got to like kind of push some financial things around and and kind of take a few more risks that I maybe wouldn't have taken if if it was just like regular work and you know so I got to cut a few more things like I cut a TV show and a couple little movies and stuff so but yeah that's a huge thing is the financial thing so I know that you said I know you said it was boring and yeah some of it is just moving accounts around and you know I know during the pandemic some people were able to like kind of delay a mortgage payment I know that I delayed my car payments for like 6 months like I took advantage of the system and I don't feel guilty about it at all not at all so everybody was able to do that and yeah if we talked about what money went into one account yeah that might be a little bit uh, burdensome and maybe people don't want to hear the details however what I do want to dig a little bit deeper into before we get to the second major trap or major hesitation is from a, a psychological and an emotional standpoint. When was the moment that you overcame the fear of, you know what, I'm too afraid to say no to something, even if I don't want to do it because it pays well? What was finally the moment where you're like, you know what, I have the power and the confidence to say no to the wrong things because I know I want this new thing badly enough? Like the exact movie that I did it on, or just either the like exact the mo- movie, the exact thought. Like what changed between I'm too afraid to say no versus I'm afraid to say no, but I'm going to. I think honestly, and I don't want to like. Be, I think it was you know I started taking the class, I started doing the 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 outreach, and kind of figuring out that I did want to edit. You know that it wasn't just like that when I was doing these smaller things, I was happier than I was assisting. I mean, I don't mind assisting. I, I like it. I, I'm just happy that I get to do this instead of work at Target or whatever it is. But I felt like it was time to take the risk. I mean, why not? And I had a few opportunities, you know, ma- hopeful opportunities coming down the pike. So I didn't want to commit to another big feature. So I, I kind of, at, at, at one point earlier this year, turned down, started turning down assistant gigs, which, yeah, that's hard to do. It's hard to do. But that has paid off. As of now, I've been cutting a few things. So it's it's kind of paid off. Without putting any words into your mouth, you can tell me if I'm characterizing this incorrectly, but you and I have had many a hot seat session. We've had many, many conversations. Um, and you've also been a fantastic mentor in the group as well. So it's kind of been a, a nice uh, reciprocal mentor-mentee relationship. So again, don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think one of the things that I've seen from you is that on a practical level, your life hasn't changed that much from the time that you and I started to where it is now, because it's been the pandemic the whole time. And you've moved a few accounts around here and there. But what I've seen is that the transition from I don't know if I should say no to some of these really big opportunities to the point where you say, yeah, I can say no to a big time uh, first assistant job on a feature film that goes for 18 months because now I have the confidence I'm going to land in the editor's chair. That's the difference I've seen in you. Would you say that's fairly accurate? I think that's somewhat accurate. And I think it's also that like because the pandemic forced everything to slow down. Like, I mean, for 22 years, I was, I'm on a movie. This one ends on Friday. The next one starts on Monday. No, you can't go on vacation. I, you know, I, I have to basically quit. The only vacations I took, and I, I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not really. If you look back at the last 20 years, I took a vacation when I broke up with an editor because it was always like on to the next one, on to the next one. And so I never had time to like stop and say, wait, do I still want to do this? And I had the time to to think about it and, you know, doing the class and doing other things. And I just had the time to think about it and realize, yeah, I do want to start cutting. So let me start trying that now instead of, you know, and the thing about it is, is that I felt I've, I've been fortunate over the past 20 years. I worked with most of the editors I worked with allowed me to cut and taught me how to cut. And I've learned things from everyone that I've worked with. And I'm only here because I've learned all those things. Like that's why I have the confidence that I can cut. I've learned stuff from Michael Kahn. I learned stuff from Dylan Titchener, Andy Monchin, Francoise Bonneau. You know, like, I mean, some of the greatest editors in the business. Yeah, I feel like I realize, thinking about it and realizing I've learned, I, I have this set of skills and I want to use them to help people tell their stories. As corny as that sounds, it sounds like a, a 
a web page or something. I don't, I, I don't think so. I don't think it sounds quite as corny as you think it does. And that is actually the perfect segue to talk about the second trap that I feel a lot of people fall into. The first of which being that they put themselves in a position where they're terrified to say no for financial reasons. The second trap that many people fall into that I feel you did as well that uh, you and I have talked about before is that you put yourself in a position where you're so good at what you do, people don't want to promote you because they want you to keep doing what you do. Where you're really good as an assistant editor and it's like, I mean, sure, we'd love the guy to cut, but we'd much rather have him just be our first assist because he's awesome and it's harder to replace him to do that, right? So you you put yourself in that trap as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and with some of the editors I worked for, I, I learned to cut so much that they liked it when I cut. They'd be like, great. It, it's like having, a you know, once dailies are done, cut this stuff for me, you know? So, um, yeah. And then I and I appreciated that because not I... I I kind of thought that might was the normal, but then I've wor- I've met a lot of other assistants that never had those opportunities. So I guess I was fortunate to get those. Um, you know, you know, thinking back on it, while you're in it, you're like, oh my god, I gotta cut and sync and do the code book. Ah. So all of that having been said, uh, we've covered some of the the fears, the barriers, the hesitations about uh, kind of what brought you to us working together. Now I want to start digging into some of the, the aha moments or the changes that you made in your approach. Because like you said at the very beginning of this interview to set it off, you can't just sit in a room with four walls and a door and be awesome at what you do and sit and wait for somebody to discover you. God, we wish it were that easy, right? If we could just be amazing and somebody walks down the hall is like, uh, hi, I heard you're awesome. Can I hire you on my next project? God, that would be so much easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, but that's you don't learn that. I mean, you don't learn that in school. I mean, if you go to film school, you don't learn that. And then when you get on the job, you don't learn that. I mean, there's very few people. I don't know. I, yeah, you don't learn it. And I, I've met people that inherently have that. I mean, years ago, uh, there was this, a friend of mine was an assistant on a movie. This doesn't have, and Eli Roth was his post PA. And Eli Roth was like, I'm moving to LA and I'm going to be a director. And then like three years later, it's like a film by Eli Roth. And it's like, what, what the hell happened? You know, he just has, there's people that have that and there are people that don't. Honestly, I, I feel that. And like the people that don't, which are us introverted editor types need to learn it if we want to get in the big chairs. And I've worked with big editors and a lot of them do have those big personalities, you know, that just, you know, they, when they walk in a room, everyone pays attention because they're, you know, the big editor and you can't be, you know, quiet and sitting in the corner and expect to you know what I'm trying to say. I, I absolutely know what you're trying to say. And I, I think hope that's coming across okay. I just, it yeah. is. And I don't think it's any coincidence that people that are largely shy and introverted and like to be creative end up in the editor's chair. Not a coincidence because the ones that are really outgoing and outspoken and extroverted, they're the ones that end up on sets, directing, acting, producing, managing everything. And then we drive them crazy because all we want to do is not be bothered and do good work and just let us go home to our families. Right. So you're right. It isn't a skill where you you don't go in college and it's not a prerequisite where you learn networking 101 or storytelling or story branding 101. Right. Um, so to clarify for both me and for everybody that's listening before you and I met, were you already trying to quote unquote sell yourself as an editor? Yeah, I mean, I had, you know, I had gotten a lot of associate and additional editor credits. And then I think before I met you, I had done on the Zombieland sequel, I got bumped up to editor on that. Like, so I got a, I, I edited a lot of the movie and the editor was a really good friend of mine and the director saw that I was cutting. And so they gave me a bump up. And after that, I was like, yeah, I want to try and start editing. And then like that came out at the end of 2019 and then the pandemic hit and it was like, oh, there's no work for anybody. So what should I do? And so I found an online class to take. So what was your approach? And I know it sounds like you weren't spending years and years and years trying to make this happen. And it was something that you decided you wanted to make happen when the world kind of shut down and got in the way of you making it happen. Um, But just as far as the conversations you did have or looking forwards to making this transition on your own, what do you think was the biggest challenge as far as actually convincing people that I can do this job? 
Yeah, I mean, the the elephant in the room is that, you know, you can't cut a studio feature until you've cut a studio feature. You can't cut a network TV show until you cut a network TV show. So it's getting that first gig and then it's getting the second gig. Um, so it's kind of like starting. I mean, I guess it's like in any business, it's starting over. When I was an assistant, you know, when I was an apprentice, I worked with this person and then that became two people and that became four people. But now my network has shrunk back down to one or two people that see me as an editor. And the other 400 people that I've met over the past 20 years still see me as an assistant. And the goal is to get those 400 to see me like the two people do now. And it's starting over. I mean, it really is. It's starting over, I think. Yeah. So if the if the catch twenty two or the elephant in the room, as you said, which we'll talk more about when we you know get to in the proverbial interview uh, room, so to speak, and we talk about some of the strategies you learn. But if the if the elephant in the room or the catch twenty two is that you need the experience to get the experience, how do you convince these four hundred other people? I'm not an assistant editor anymore. How do you convince them that you're an editor? <laughs> God. Uh... Yeah, I'm working on it. I mean, you try and get more editing gigs to build up your reel and resume. But you need editing gigs to get editing gigs. So I'm totally confused. How do we make this happen? Yeah. Um, you get people to vouch for you. You call in favors. You network. You, 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 uh, that's, I mean, that's, I guess that's how I did it. I just, it's funny when you, when I started turning down editor gigs, more people started saying, oh, what about this then? And, you know, I didn't get a lot of them, but at least they started thanking me for things and recommending me for things. And I was getting a few interviews. So I don't know what the answer you're looking for, Zach. Uh, well, I, I wasn't looking for an answer. I just wanted to get your perspective because I, I want to dig deeper into this because I feel like this is where so many people get stuck. Yeah. They think to um, themselves. It's hard and I haven't really figured it out yet. I mean, I don't have the answer. My my strategy is letting all the people know that I think of me as an assistant, that I'm moving into the editor's chair, that I moved into the editor's chair, and then, you know, keeping in touch with them. And after the next gig saying, hey, I just finished this one or and and also trying to meet new people to to branch out into more um different things because you know it's it's pretty busy right now well given that you don't have all the answers and how dare you not have all the answers um we're gonna dig into this a little bit deeper we're gonna do kind of our own little impromptu hot seat right now you've been on many many hot seats so you're you're familiar you you know what's coming um but the challenge that we're gonna solve for you today and i think you actually know a lot more about this than maybe is uh, is coming to mind because we've had this conversation several times but here's the challenge that we're gonna solve for you and for everybody else that's stuck in a similar position First question, if we're rewinding six, nine months before the point where you're now editing this feature on your own, let's say that you're at the point where you've just finished your latest uh, big feature as a first assist. If you get hired to cut a fairly sizable feature film, maybe not the Tomorrow War, but we're talking a studio movie, maybe $20 million. If you get hired on that job and you start at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, do you have any hesitation about your ability to do the job? No, no, no. Okay, so do you have any hesitation about the skills necessary to do that job well? No, I mean, I know what it takes to edit a studio feature because I've been on studio features for 20 years. So it's, it, and, and I, I think, yeah, I guess you're right. It's, so it's, it's, it's trying to convince the people that are hiring that that is actually an asset. Because if you hire someone that, you know, a, a, and I'm not... I don't want this to come out wrong, but if you hire like a snazzy wonderkind guy that doesn't know the ins and out of a feature, they could get a very overwhelmed very quick. It, it, there's so many moving pieces. There's so many departments. It's more than just editing. It's running a department. You know, it, it's it's so. I mean, and editing is a big. Don't don't get me wrong. Like the skill of editing is number one. You have to know how to put the pieces together and tell a story. But there are other things to it that, you know, are valuable that you can bring to a cutting room. I mean, I've worked with editors that I worked with an editor that became a therapist because that was her calling. You know, she was done with editing and she's a therapist. now. It's like, you know, there are other things you can bring to the to the cutting room. 
um, to help. It's funny because in a way, I kind of feel like without the degree, that's kind of what's ended up happening to me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've kind no, of become an unofficial therapist helping people through these transitions. Um, but to, to get back to the, the brass tacks of somebody's like, what is the strategy already? The strategy that's so important that you and I have worked through is how do I make it very clear that even though I don't have the experience, so somebody looks on paper, they look at a short one page list of credits, they're going to say, you can't do this. The story you need to be able to tell is I have all of the transferable skills to do this way better than somebody that maybe has done a couple of things like this in the past, but hasn't done it at this level. Right. So you talked about you've been in the room with Michael Kahn and Dylan Titchener and Billy Goldenberg and all these other people. Very, very few people have ever worked at that level, even as an assistant. But I'm assuming that you're not just sitting in a room by yourself and uh, organizing dailies and putting in time codes and putting on burn-ins for outputs. Like there's probably a lot of the creative process that you're heavily involved with. Yes, absolutely. And that 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 was one of my points is that like. I've learned from every one of those people. And that's, that's where my skill set comes from. My skill set comes from some of the best in the industry. And I didn't just sit there and, and sink dailies and give them the bins and sit in my room. And, you know, I was very involved in, I mean, I learned a lot from, and I mean, Dylan, Dylan used to write with Paul. I mean, I never worked on a Paul Thomas Anderson movie with them, but he would write with Paul. So the movies that I did work with Dylan like he would get involved in pre-production. I would be doing continuities before they even started shooting. And we'd be talking about like scenes and structure and stuff like that with the director. Like that stuff you can't, I mean, it's, it's precious to learn that stuff, you know? Um, so yeah, I take that all as, as an asset. And do you feel that that's a story that you were very clearly telling before about how you had the skills even though you didn't have the experience? No, I definitely wasn't telling that clearly before. And I can tell it verbally talking to you now, but still like putting it on a website or putting it on a resume is still, you know, I'm getting closer, but I haven't cracked that egg yet. No, I think one of the things we've talked about is is getting in the room for the interview. And I feel like what I've learned over the past, you know, six, eight months, whatever it is, is if I can get in the room... I think I have a pretty good shot of getting the interview. I just need to get in the room. And, 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 you know, sometimes it doesn't happen today. For instance, it, you know, I had a, I had an opportunity maybe, and it was just like, now they're not interested and that's fine. You know, I get it. Like, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes it does. So that having been said, let's talk about how to get in the room because this was another area that you were very hesitant about. You even said in our very first conversation, you probably don't remember because it's been like nine months, but I listened to the whole thing earlier today just to refresh me of what, what was day one like. And you even said to me almost verbatim, it's like you listened to it yourself and you copied your words. You're like, listen, I've worked with people like Dylan and Billy and Michael Kahn, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I can't put that in a letter. Like, I, I can't be that egotistical guy that puts that in a letter. I don't want to bother people, right? I don't want to put myself out there and be a bother. And one of the fundamental mindset shifts that we've worked on that I think has been transformational for you and has also been amazing for a lot of other students in the group is that you no longer reach out to bother people. What's the mindset shift that we've made instead about why we're reaching out and connecting with people? Yeah, I mean, it's to provide value and that that's like the mantra or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But for me, it even goes beyond that. And what I've learned a little bit is that people don't mind being bothered. And I've learned, like, introspectively, I've learned that I don't mind being bothered. And I actually kind of like it if the circumstance, if it's done properly, you know, if it's done properly. Like you always say, like, when you get those emails that are just mass emails, it's like, hey, just finished this, looking for this, here's my resume. It's like, yeah. But if it's done in a way that you can kind of reconnect with someone or even make a new friend. Uh, I, th I think that's, that's providing value. Even if it's, even if it's not like getting a job, it's still providing some kind of value, especially now in, in pandemic where like you don't see people in the hall or anything like that. It's, it's, it's nice getting a message from somebody. Right. It's, it's one of the, the analogies that I use in the class that you took is that if you're somebody that delivers flowers for a living, 
nobody's upset to see you. You knock on the door, they open the door and they smile because you're making their day brighter. You're bringing something new to them, providing value. And as we talked about, that can be done via an email or a social media message or whatever it is. So like you said, you don't mind being bothered when it's not really being bothered at somebody instead trying to do their best to make your day yeah, just a little bit better. Right, exactly. And I also find that people actually do want to help you If you can make that connection, they're more inclined to try and help with what you're trying to do. My sincerest apologies for this brief interruption. But if you are a creative professional who spends long hours at your desk and you are searching for a simple and affordable solution to optimize both your energy and your focus, not only is the following promo not an interruption, but listening has the potential to change your life. Here is a brief excerpt from a recent interview that I did with Ergo-Driven co-founder and CEO Kit Perkins, the creator of the Topomat, who's here today to talk about his newest product, New Standard Whole Protein. I'm into health and fitness generally, but I want it to be simple and straightforward. About a year, year and a half ago, I started adding collagen into my protein shakes. And man, the benefits were like more dramatic than any supplement I've ever seen. So I thought, if I can just get this down to coming out of one jar, and it's ingredients that I know I can trust, and you just put it in water, and you don't have to think about it. When people think of protein powders, they think, well, I don't want to get big and bulky. And that's not what this is about. To me, this is about repair. So a big part of what we're talking about here is you are what you eat. Your body's constantly repairing and rebuilding and the only stuff it can use to repair and rebuild is what you've been eating unfortunately as the years have gone by every day getting out of bed it's like you know two or three creaks and pops in the first couple steps and that i thought you just sort of live with now but yeah once starting the collagen daily or near daily it's just gone so for us job 1a here was make sure it's high quality and that's grass-fed 100 pasture raised cows and then the second thing if you're actually going to do it every day it needs to be simple it needs to taste good well My goal is that for anybody that is a creative professional like myself that's stuck in front of a computer, number one, they're doing it standing on a topo mat. Number two, they've got a glass of new standard protein next to them so they can just fuel their body, fuel their brain. So uh, you and I, my friend, one edit station at a time are going to change the world. And even better for your listeners with code OPTIMIZE on either a one-time purchase or that first subscribe and save order, 50% off. So if you do that subscribe and save, that's 20% off and 50% off with code OPTIMIZE. That's a fantastic deal. If you're looking for a simple and affordable way to stay energetic, focused, and alleviate the chronic aches and pains that come from living at your computer, I recommend New Standard Whole Protein because it's sourced from high quality ingredients that I trust and it tastes great. To place your first order, visit optimizeyourself.me slash new standard and use the code optimize for 50% off your first order. So if we could pull out one kind of uh, microcosm success story from the outreach lessons that you've learned, what do you think that uh, that moment or that connection or that conversation or something you've learned from somebody else would be from the journey that you've gone on? Hmm. I got to think about this. I mean, rephrase that again. Just- yeah. So if we think about all the things that we talked about, then, you know, in theory, they all sound great. Right. But none of it means anything until you put it into practice. Oh, so like give me a con- thing. Okay. Give yeah, me a concrete honestly. example of you changing your approach, connecting with somebody and what you really got out of it and what they got out of it as well. I think one of the aha moments I had in the class was the idea of making an email so skimmable that you can respond to it while you're waiting in line at the grocery store. I mean, because if it's something that you have to spend a half hour to respond to, it's, it's more difficult. But if I'm, you know, waiting in line at the grocery store and you can, so it's, it's brief and it's, and it's a really quick ask at the beginning, just to introduce yourself really. Um, And, you know, never send your resume with your first outreach, Um, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, I think that that was the real aha moment was the the thing about getting it to a point where it's a really easy to respond to. And then for me, objectively looking at my emails and saying, no, this is not easy to respond to. I have to, you know, rewrite it. And, you know, and now I've gotten to that point where I think I've gotten it you know, better than I had it before. 
I think you've gotten it much better than you had it before, for sure. Yeah. Not like you were doing it wrong before, uh, but you've certainly seen much more positive results and responses. Yeah, I definitely have. And I, the, 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 but the, the fact of the matter is I don't enjoy outreach. I've never enjoyed it. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'd taken the, the self-guided focus yourself but I knew if I was at the end of that, I knew if I was going to write these emails, I had to be forced to. So I should take the class because I, you had said, like, we work on the email for six weeks and we read the emails in class. And I was like, all right, well, then they're going to make me do it. So I, that's because, yeah, I mean that. And maybe not everybody's like that. I don't know. But for me, I knew... That was the only way it was going to happen is if I someone made me do it. Yeah, well, that that being said, with as miserable as the process is, I'm now rethinking the title of the course. It should be Eat Your Vegetables. Yeah, right. Because right? it's just like, oh, God, I know I need to eat my vegetables. I know it's good for me, but I'm just going to need somebody to force feed that food down my throat. And that's kind of what networking and outreach is like for some people. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So now what I'd like to do is flip the script a little bit. We've been talking so far about you being in the position of somebody that wants to make the transition and move forwards. You want to go from the first assistant chair to the editor's chair. As long as we're talking about outreach, I would assume that over the course of your 20 plus year career with as high profile as the projects are that you work on, you've had people reach out to you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it got to the point where, yeah, you don't even have to send a resume anymore. People just look on IMDb and, and, and call you. Um, and I'm not saying that like egotistically. It just, it, like I said, it, one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, and it just keeps, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you work with Steven Spielberg and you're like, what? How did this happen? Right. Uh, I mean, I it, still like, it's still kind of weird to me that I, you know, it's very bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all of which is great, but I guess what I was asking to rephrase a little bit is not people reaching out to you for jobs, people reaching out to you with their outreach, wanting oh, yeah, advice definitely. or knowing if you're looking for work or you're looking for a PA or a second assist. I'm guessing you've got a lot of outreach directed at you, right? Yeah, a lot, quite often, yeah. What's the difference between the ones you respond to and the ones you don't? I mean, a lot of them are... If, if, if they say like, hey, we know the same person or like even I think with Annie, I think she was from Michigan and I knew Sarah Brochar from when I worked with Steven was from Michigan and Sarah's super into helping people from Michigan. So I was like, oh, Annie needs to meet Sarah. Like, you know. So that's, that's a lot of it. Um, I think, you know, if it's, if it's a generic email or if it's like, Hey, I got, uh, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to sit in judgment of people's emails, but we don't yeah. have to use names, but in general, I think it's really important to hear what gets your attention and what doesn't, you know, if it's generic, just finish this looking for the next gig, blah, blah, blah. And like nothing almost form like hey blank like i think of that heather's the movie heather's where she has the speech like hey blank and she goes on with the speech like that mm -hmm. like you know it's not a lot of thought put into it so i'm not going to put a lot of thought back i guess you know you kind of it's a balance you know if, if a lot of if i look at something and a lot of thoughts going into it then i i i feel more obligated to respond than if it's just like hey here's my resume let me know if you hear of anything you know, um, and now there's a lot of emails because of the, the way the business, they, you know, there's so much work where people are just like emailing, like, we need a VFX editor now. And it's just like, you don't even know who they are. It's just, it's crazy. But yeah, I think that's a big difference is, is adding a personal touch to it, um, spending a little bit of time. And then if you have some kind of connection, you have a mutual connection or even a, I'm from Boston too, or something like that. Throw it in there because it, you know, I've hired people because they were from Boston. Because you know, so to start I'm like, with, yay, Boston, but, yeah. But, oh, you don't know Avid? No problem. You're from Boston. Yeah, cool. No, no, we'll no, figure no, it no. out. <laughs> so really, it, the 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 first part of it is that it really comes down to: Did you take the time to write to me, or did you just kind of copy and paste the template? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second part that I want to dig into a little bit deeper is, and I'm would guess that you probably make similar assumptions of people that you want to reach out to. But if I wanted to reach out to you, 
if I'm a young second assistant editor or I'm somebody that's breaking in, my first thought is, Chris Patterson, are you kidding? Like he's worked with Michael Kahn and all these people in Spielberg. He doesn't want to help me. Why, why is that the wrong assumption? I don't know. I mean, it's human nature to want to help people. I mean, not to get all, you know, weird about it, but like, if, if you don't want to help somebody, then what's wrong with you? You know, I mean, unless, you know, and it, there are certain people you don't want to help. And I'm not saying you got to help everybody, but if you're a decent person and you, you show enthusiasm and, and, and you can be an asset because you never know if someone's looking for somebody and you might, I mean, that, that's also timing has a lot to do with success in this business is, I, I don't know how you phrase it sometimes, but you know, if you email someone and you're on the top of their mind, then it's timing. If, if, if they have, if they hear of a job and you emailed them last week, they might recommend you for it. Whereas you email the, but then again, it's a catch 22 because you can't email someone every week and you know, it's so Monday. It, it, I'm available. Right. It's like, so it, a lot of it is luck and timing of, of hitting the person. But what I was also saying is if you're reaching out to someone to ask for like, I'm a second assistant, you know, you're a first, I'd like to know X, Y, and Z, you could be providing an asset because you never know if, if they're looking for someone or they know someone that's looking for someone. I mean, I've, I've had to hire people on movies. I've had to crew up movies when it's been very difficult because there's nobody available. You can't find people or, or, you know, no one wants to go on location or this or that or the other thing. So it's always good to have a bigger pool. And I think to, to sum it up and you were kind of searching, cause you know that I have a saying about this and you're like, I know he has a saying, what is yeah. the saying, right? But so my saying is, and I seriously should make a t-shirt that says this, you don't have to be the best candidate you just need to be the most recent candidate. That's, yeah, if you're yeah. on the top of somebody's mind, if you're qualified and you've been con uh, having conversations with them recently, as I'm sure you've had happen many times, if all of a sudden you need a second assistant or a PA or whatever it is, you don't have this giant Google spreadsheet of every single person you've ever met categorized by their skills and their experience and who's available and who's not available. It's just, wait, who was that guy that emailed me last week? Oh yeah, Bill, let's get him in here. He seemed nice, right? So you you have to stay on top of people's minds. But again, it can't just be, hey, it's Monday morning, I'm here and I'm available. That's why you have to learn to continuously provide value. So every time you see somebody's name in your inbox, you think, oh, every time they email me, they've got something nice to say. I should open this and see what they're up to, right? And the, the other part that I want to close the loop on that I also think is so important is this misconception that people above us or ahead of us in our careers, they wouldn't want to help us. And one of the other things we talk about in the program that, again, could be an alternate T-shirt. This could be like, you know, the Tuesday, Thursday T-shirt as opposed to the other one, which is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, is saying it's not that people don't want to help you. It's that they don't understand how to help you. So if you can make it very clear to somebody, if I were to write to you and make it clear, here's where I am in my journey, I would really like to get where you are at some point. Here are some of the things I'm struggling with. Do you feel enough empathy that you want to help them out and move them a little bit closer to that goal? Yeah, because people have helped me. I mean, you know, I didn't get to being a first assistant, you know, on, a, on big movies without any help. So, yeah, of course I would help um, if, if the person's worth it. I mean, because I've also helped people and been burned before, you know, and that sucks and that makes you a little bit gun shy, but you have to get over that because, you know, um, and I'm sure that's happened to you in the past, you know. Oh, yes. I've, I've done favors for more than one person, which is why I'm a lot more selective about all the emails that I take the time to answer, the people that I actually talk to on 30-minute Zoom calls, the people that are in the program. I make sure that whomever it is that wants to help is willing to put in the necessary action to get the results, as opposed to, hey, just shorten my learning curve and make my life easier so I don't have to go through all the same hardships that you did, Right. I want people that are willing to dig through the trenches, but I'm willing to show them the way so they don't hit all the, the pitfalls and potholes that I did when I was going through the same trenches. Right. And the, yeah, and your 20 years experience or whatever, however many years it is can help with that. I mean, I would say there's a lot of things I would do differently having done it for 20 years, but you know, that's neither here nor there. You can't go back. So 
whatever, but you can maybe guide someone in a different direction, you know? So the the last exercise that I want to take us through and then we're going to wrap up because my guess is you probably have to go right back to work even though it's nights, you probably got outputs and all this other craziness to deal with. I have one other exercise that I want to take you through that I know is going to make you squirm in your seat because I, I, I know the button to push with you now and it's the humility button. You are so humble about how good you are at what you do and I think that it's great until it's not. And one of the areas where it's not so great is when you have to promote yourself and right. brand yourself as the person that has the skills but doesn't have the experience. So I want to walk you through an exercise that you may or may not remember that we've done before, but I'm doing it for the sake of somebody else that's listening that feels like, well, I can't talk about my skills or things that I'm good at. Like, I don't want to come off as egotistical. I want to help people with that challenge. And there's an exercise that you and I did once. You probably don't remember it, but I got you out of your shell. Okay. And this is an exercise that anybody can emulate if they have a friend or a colleague that they trust. So if I were to ask you, Chris, what are all the qualities that you have that make you great at what you do and make you hireable and make it worth it to hire you as an editor? I already know your answer is going to be, I don't know. Like, I'm, it's like I just, I know that face. You're going to get really uncomfortable. You're. I only wish people that are listening could see your face right yeah, now. Yeah, we're not videoing. Priceless. This isn't like a video podcast. Uh, it may end up being a video, no. one, but at least for now, it's audio only and your face was priceless. But there's an exercise I took you through where I got you out of your shell. And it's a really important one that I want other people to be able to do. And it's so simple. All right. Here's how I'm going to reframe this. I want you to tell me in the third person about a colleague that you've worked with for 20 years. His name is Chris Patterson. Why do people keep hiring Chris? I keep talking to all these people and they say, you got to hire Chris for your next feature. What are the skills that Chris has? Talk to me about why he gets hired the way that he does and why he so consistently gets work. I don't want to about, know about you. I want to know about Chris Patterson. Right. Chris Patterson, he's he's loyal. He's uh, He gets the job done. He knows post-production extremely well. Um, he knows how to think outside the box and just get stuff done. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a great first assistant. He can cut, he can sync, he can, he can do sound, he can do music, he can do VFX. Um, and he has 20 years experience proving that. I don't know. Is that <laughs> All that's wonderful, but I don't care about him being an assistant anymore. He's been referred to me to cut my feature. Why should I hire Chris as my editor? Because he can do the job. Uh, he'll get he'll he'll get the job done. God, this is harder than this is. I don't remember. I don't this call exercise. it. The, I don't call this the lukewarm seat. No, I know. Um, yeah, he'll get the job done with the experience that he has. He'll he'll he really put me in the hot seat, huh? You you um, were on a roll until I switched it to editor. And the reason I brought that up, you notice how your confidence level changed. Yeah, I mean, I know I can do it, but what 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 makes the difference? I mean, yes, the, it's the it's the fact that my background is that I get stuff done, and if I don't know how to do something, I'll figure it out. That's how I've been my whole life. Yeah, if he if he doesn't know how to do something, he'll figure it out, but he knows how to edit. I, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but I would say that that that's a huge asset that so many people miss. Where I don't expect somebody to know everything and have all the answers, but what I want to know. As a core character trait, are you going to be able to figure things out when it gets rough? Right. I, I guess I'm having an aha moment right now It's in that, like, what I would say is I know how to cut. Like, I know the, the there's this Picasso quote, learn the rules like a, learn the rules like a master so you can break them like an artist. And so that, 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 that that's, that's what I would sum it up with is he knows all the rules of editing and he knows that when you screw something up, when, you sh when you've shot something and it's screwed up, he will figure out a way to make it work. Um, that's what editing is. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of times that happens is, is, you know, dailies don't come out the way they want them to be. Something happens and they have to cut the day short or, you know, something, you know, and you have to, fi you have to be able to roll with it and figure it out and, and be, um, uh, accommodating and, and, and figure out how to get stuff done. So what we've but been doing... I didn't doing, do that in third person, did I? Crap. You didn't. You switched over, but you realize how you kept going and you yeah. got good at it by talking about yourself. That's yeah. how powerful this exercise is. What we've been yeah, doing, yeah, yeah. what we've been doing this whole time, you didn't even know that I was doing it. We're putting together your story package for your next interview. 
Here, here's how we're going to structure this. You start your next interview, whether it's on Zoom, in person, or otherwise, to edit your next film. What is most likely going to be their first question? Not always, but usually what's the first question? Tell me about yourself. Oh, God. It's the laziest, worst first interview question, and everybody's going to ask it, so you have to be prepared for it. What we're doing is we're constructing the story that you're going to tell, and we're going to piece together some of the things that you just talked about. One of the things you talked about much, much earlier, which we address in the room immediately, is the big, giant elephant standing in the corner. Instead of, well... Uh, you know, I've been an assistant editor for 20 years. You know, I've, uh, you know, worked on some big films and I've worked with some really great, uh, uh, some great editors. I worked with Spielberg. It was all fantastic, but um, I've, I, I think I'm ready. I think, I think I can do the cutting. Oh man, I, I don't know. This guy didn't yeah, seem like he, he's ready, right? Yeah, that's not going to get me a job. But that's what gonna... if instead you you answered this question the following way? All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, but first let's just address the elephant in the room. Everybody's probably thinking, yes, I've got 20 years of experience as an assistant. I was great as an assistant. I'm even better as an editor, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to share a quote with you that's going to personify who I am. Uh, and then you say the, the Picasso quote about being a master, being an artist, right? So I may not have all the credits that you're looking for, but over the last 20 years, I've worked with some of the most formative professionals and biggest names in the history of our craft. I know how to cut. I know how to get the job done. I've learned the rules like a master and I will break them like an artist. Now, how is my level of confidence as the person that wants to hire you as my editor, even though your credits don't tell the story? I mean, you're going to remember that person at the very least, you know, even if you don't hire them, even if you go with Roger Barton, let's say, um, you know, you're going to remember that person. Absolutely. But let's talk about that. If you're up for the same movie with Roger Barton, but what are the odds it. you're getting that job? Zero. Zero if he's available. Why would anybody hire you over Roger Barton? That's insane. So that means you put yourself in the wrong position. You put yourself in a position to fail instead of succeed. We've right. also talked about what's the sweet spot for you to make this transition. Where are you going to be an asset rather than a liability? Smaller movies where they need a lot of help because they don't know what they're doing. I mean, you know, and that that, that is a lot of, you know, these small movies that I have been doing is it's been a lot more than just editing. It's been kind of guiding them through the post-production process, which I know very well. I mean, I, you know, not that I want to be a post super or anything, but like I could, if, if you kind of have to be, to be some days, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> what is the number one challenge that you're solving? And they're thankful for you providing so much value in this specific scenario where you come to them. It's a lower budget, either studio film, indie film, What's the number one challenge that you're ultimately solving for them? Uh, that I kind of can do, wear a couple different hats. I mean, you know, um, which is helpful. I mean, yeah. Let's dig even deeper. We've actually talked about this too. You might not remember having this session. What's the number one challenge that I have as a producer and then ultimately the director as well, but ultimately the producer that wants to hire an editor on a lower budget film? Making sure that the movie gets finished. I Making mean, sure the movie gets finished. And obviously the editor is a part of that. But the ultimate fear they probably have, at least as far as post-production is concerned, how am I going to get somebody that knows what they're doing with the amount of money that I have? Yeah. yeah. Right? And you're coming in there saying, you don't understand. I want the credit and I want the experience. And I will work for less. I'm not saying you should devalue yourself. Right. But at the same time, you're in this sweet spot right now where the experience is more valuable than the paycheck. You're not going to sit there and negotiate for an extra 100 or $200 a week if you feel like you can manage it because you know how much more valuable it is to be in the timeline, to work with the director, to build relationships, and have the credit. So ultimately, you're put, putting yourself in a position where, dear Lord, are they lucky to have somebody like you that's available? As opposed to, why can't I keep getting jobs when they're interviewing Roger Barton? Right, right. Right. And I, th I feel like that's one of the traps that a lot of people fall into when they make the transition is they just leap over all of those stepping stones and they say, well, I want to go from assistant to editor and I want to edit Game of Thrones or I want to edit the next giant movie. It's like, no, there's a lot of stuff in between where you become a valuable asset as opposed to a liability and they just can't take the chance on you because there's too much risk. Right. And that's also how you get your first first assistant job is it's a smaller budget movie and you're a second and you you're the only assistant so you're by 
default the first, you know? I mean, that's just, that's how every job happens. And that's how every transition happens is you have to move a little bit backwards to go forward. So, I mean, and I'm not saying some people get, you know, blessed and get, but for most people, you have to kind of zigzag a little bit in the career. Um, and I don't think that's just true of the film industry. I think it's true of everything. Yeah, this has nothing to do with the film industry. I actually, I, just today I saw a post in Facebook um, where somebody was saying, I want to make a career transition. And for me, the transition is I want to leave post-production. Is there anybody out there that knows how to handle career transitions? And they even mentioned me and they tagged me by name. They said, I know that Zach helps people make a transition in post, but I want out. And I said, I, this has nothing to do with post-production. Yeah, I happen to be an editor and a lot of the people that follow me are in post. This is just about how to make a transition to do something differently and tell the story that I have the skills to do this, even though I don't have the experience. That can be applied to anything. Right. Yeah. No, you're right. So, uh, on that note, we are going to wrap up, but the the final uh, question that I want to leave you with is if there were one piece of sage advice or wisdom you could give to either a younger listener or somebody that's less experienced that's looking to get where you are now, what's the most common or valuable experience that you've given people in the past that you want to share? I mean, like the real basic one, and I say this jokingly, but not really, is always have a notebook and write everything down. And and I've been like I, I and I say that jokingly, but there was actually a, a a show where someone was fired, and I replaced that person. And the first time I went into the editor's room and had a notebook, she started screaming, "You have a fucking notebook! The other guy never had a fucking notebook, and I had to get <laughs> rid of him. <laughs> he never wrote anything down." And I was like, "Oh my god!" And so that's a piece of advice. Sorry if I, I maybe I shouldn't have. Swore. We'll bleep it out. Don't worry. Okay. So that is like honestly a piece of advice. Like, and 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 I, I've said that to many people. Write everything down, even even if you don't feel you need to. It puts the person that's asking you to do things. It puts their mind at ease that they know you're going to get the stuff done because you've written it down or at least. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big piece of advice. Um, and then uh, f final parting thought, if we were to rewind to where you were about nine months ago and we have somebody else that's where you were, where they're totally on the fence, they're like, I kind of feel like I need to help, but you know, maybe the time's bad or I'm too busy or it seems kind of scary. What advice would you give to yourself or to somebody in a similar position that's thinking, I want to dive in. I want to get the coaching. I want to get the mentorship, but I'm kind of scared and I'm not sure about this. I, I would recommend doing it because I, I feel like, like I said, for me, I know that if I'm not forced to do something, I won't do it. So it held me accountable to do things and to show up every week. And I, and I knew I had the time to do it. And there was a period at one point where I was busy for a few weeks and had to move things around and it all worked out. But I think overall it, it, it 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 worked and you got to meet a bunch of other people that were kind of there. I mean, everyone's story, even though it was different, you know, I worked at, I did web videos or I'm coming from reality TV and want to get into scripted or whatever, but they're all the same story. And you realize that there's, you're not alone and yeah, everyone's in the same boat. So it, it, it helps. It, 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 it's, a, it's a nice community. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. It's a community within a community, you know, as cheesy as that sounds. but Right. And, and you're right that, that everybody's different stories sound exactly the same. Well, I've had this conversation at least 1,200 times now because I, I create an Evernote every time I have one of these conversations or sessions. It's all the same thing. Same notes over and over and over and over. We're all going through the same challenges and struggles. I think the problem is because we are stuck in these small, dark rooms by ourselves, we don't realize everybody else is going through it. That's one of the, the tough things about post. And when you're in production, you're all working the 18-hour days together. In post, you don't feel that especially with work from home. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And that that's definitely, yeah, you're right about that. Um, yeah, that's true. So, uh, well, on that note, um, for somebody that is so soft-spoken and humble, you were certainly more than willing to open up and you gave me what I think is a pretty fantastic interview and right, a lot of great insights. edit some stuff, I hope. There, there's good, you know, there's going to be a little bit of cleanup here and there, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Really, the only editing we have to do is thanks to Zoom. Um, other than that, I, I think we're just going to keep it pretty much as is because I'm uh, beyond pleased and very appreciative. And I really thank you for taking the time and your crazy busy schedule to, to come chat with me and impart uh, 
some of your knowledge and wisdom on my audience. Great. Yeah, no, it was fun. Uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, have a good night. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss future interviews just like this one, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. And as a quick reminder, don't forget that enrollment is open this week only to join the fall semester of my Optimizer coaching and mentorship program. To learn more about all the different ways that you and I can work together to achieve your most important professional and personal goals, visit optimizeyourself.me slash optimizer. Enrollment closes Monday, September 13th. And once again, a special thank you to our sponsor, Ergo Driven, for making today's interview possible. To learn more about Ergo Driven and my favorite product for standing workstations, the Topo Mat, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. To learn more about Ergo Driven and their brand new product that I'm super excited about, New Standard Whole Protein, visit optimizeyourself.me slash New Standard. Thank you for listening. Stay safe, healthy, and sane, and be well.